So good evening to everyone who's here with us this evening. I'm Esther Giles of the Socialist Labour Network Steering Committee, and I'm chairing the meeting this evening. This meeting, never again, has been arranged by the Socialist Labour Network in partnership with Jewish Network for Palestine, and, and thanks to our friends there. Saturday the 27th of January, today, is Holocaust Memorial Day, and we're holding this meeting to remember and commemorate all the victims of the Nazi Holocaust, and also to say never again for everyone. Not only did six million Jews die during the Nazi Holocaust, but so do did Roma and Sinter Gypsies, disabled people, three million Russian prisoners of war, up to three million Poles, as well as millions of Russian civilians. In total, it's estimated that 15 to 20 million people died in the Nazi Holocaust. We welcome our speakers this evening, all of whom bring their perspectives to the memory of those whose lives were taken. We will hear from our speakers and then we will have time to take contributions and questions from the floor to the panel. So our speakers this evening will be Stephen Capos, Dr. Garda Carney, Ronnie Casriels, Suzanne Weiss, Professor Ilan Pape, and Tony Greenstein. And our first speaker this evening is Stephen Capos. Um, Stephen, we, we, we welcome you again. Um, and just to remind yeah. people, Stephen was born in 1937 in Budapest, Hungary, to a family of Jewish heritage. And from 1944, his family was in hiding from the Nazis. His father was deported to Belzen and Herrenstadt. His mother and siblings and Stephen were in hiding on false papers. He left Hungary for the UK following the 1956 uprisings in Hungary and spent his professional career in the UK as an architect. Stephen was a Labour Party member from 1997 until last year. He was in Holborn and St Pancras CLP until he was suspended by the Labour Party following his speaking at our meeting on Holocaust Memorial Day a year ago. So welcome back, Stephen, um, and over to you. Thank you very much for speaking this evening. Well, hello, everybody. Um, just a quick correction. Actually, I wasn't suspended. I was warned that disciplinary actions would start if I spoke uh, about my Holocaust experiences uh, at an SLN meet, uh, meeting. And I then resigned uh, in response to that. So okay, thank you. Wasn't suspended. Um, well, Hungary has a long tradition of anti Semitism, and uh, even be way before the Holocaust, um, Hungary was very briefly um, um, a, a sort of socialist republic following the Russian Revolution, and that was put down by um, the uh, right-wing Admiral Horthy, who, who became a regent uh, thereupon of, of Hungary, and then very autocratic, racist right-wing ruler. And uh, sort of white terror started, and then it settled down to just um, right-wing autocratic regime. Um, Hungary boasted the first racist laws in Europe, um, the so-called numerous clauses, which was brought in 1922, um, which limited uh, the number of Jewish students at universities. And my father, as a result, had to do some of his studies in Prague, in the German Un University of Prague. War reached Hungary in 1944. Um, although Hungary joined the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union in 41 um, as an ally in a minor role, um, Hungary didn't have a comparable powerful army, but they had all kinds of policing jobs and minor um, assisting uh, fights uh, along the Germans. Um, but by 44, um, it became fairly clear that, uh, well, very clear that 
the war was lost for the uh, German allies and uh, Horty started negotiating um, secretly behind uh, Hitler's back about a separate peace with the allies. The Germans got wind of that and invaded Hungary, um, which happened in March 44. And that date, March 1944, was a total disaster for the Jewish population because shortly afterwards in came Eichmann and, uh, and a very serious um, reign of terror and the deportations started in Hungary. First uh, wave of deportations and transportations were from the countryside. Um, Budapest, uh, which had a considerable Jewish population was left to a much later stage. And, uh, but the Hungarian authorities, particularly the police, joined in with the Germans with great enthusiasm about um, the um, arrest and, and uh, deportation of, of the, and transportation of the Jews, so that about 400,000 people um, fell into that uh, wave. Um, amongst them, many of my extended family, some of whom lived in Transylvania, some in the south of Hungary, um, altogether 15 members of my family were transported and died in um, Auschwitz, mostly in Auschwitz. Um, one or two came back, which I'll come to later. Um, so, um, as, as the uh, Nazi regime had greater influence in, in Budapest, um, a, a much increased uh, terror started uh, against the Jews. And um, eventually there were a series of three or four Jewish laws, so racial laws against the Jews enacted and each one more severe than the next. Um, they were limiting um, uh, ownership rights, ability to practice professions, and later even to use public transport, to own radios, or bicycles, and then we had to wear the yellow star. Um, regardless of age, I mean, I myself at seven, age seven was wearing ye a yellow star, although I didn't quite appreciate the significance of it. My parents did on the other hand, and uh, I was very much aware of their increased anxiety and so on. We were also concentrated in uh, apartment buildings which were a sort of uh, archipelago of um, ghettos because they were marked with with a um, star of David on the front, above the front or beside the front door uh, in, in, a, in a very large size. And uh, only Jews were allowed to live in those buildings and they were concentrated into it. And uh, obviously this was all preparatory to an efficient system of deportation. My father was um, briefly called up into the uh, labor force of the auxiliary Hungarian army, which was a um, rather humiliating kind of status. Uh, they, were, um, uh, they were in uniform, but without insignia, and of course not given any weapons and uh, under guard and they were destined to be uh, used on the Eastern Front, digging uh, trenches and, uh, and clearing minefields. Uh, very often under a brutal um, Hungarian army officer in, in sort of rather sadistic circumstances um, and, and starved. The survival rate was about 10%. So my father was briefly in a camp preparatory to being transported to the Eastern Front. And um, this is when an amazing um, um, action occurred of my mom and my aunt in uh, on false papers with um, 
Red Cross uniforms bluff their way into one of these camps. They bribed the guards and they took out both my father and uncles uh, to be brought back to our flats. There was no safety there either, but it was a lot better uh, to, to be safe from that camp. Um, very briefly after that, uh, the whole family um, entered one of um, uh, the Zionist Kastner um, camps in Budapest, which was a kind of special camp negotiated with Eichmann, with the knowledge of uh, the, the Nazi leadership, Himmler and uh, Kaltenbrunner, with a, a, a highly controversial kind of um, collaborationist deal with the Nazis, whereby um, if, if they were transported uh, to safety eventually through Berg and Belsen, then um, they would be freed in Switzerland, uh, provided that uh, various munitions, uh, I mean, trucks rather, and, and other useful army supplies were given plus cash to the Nazis in, in return. Uh, two transports already went, and my father was supposed to have been in the third. And I myself was in that camp briefly, but then it was considered, um, you know, there were various rumors that it wasn't safe, and we left the camp. It was allowed to leave it, and um, back to the flat. It was then that I was taken off on false papers into these uh, protected homes so-called protect, protected homes of um, uh, on, uh, protected by, uh, to some extent, by the Swiss Red Cross. Uh, everybody on false papers, and we were supposed to have been um, escapees and orphans escaping the advancing Russian forces. Um, it, it was actually a fairly dicey situation because uh, the Arrow Cross, the Hungarian fascist groups, which were positioned nearby, uh, always suspected that uh, this was all uh, a false uh, situation. And they tried to raid uh, the place a number of times and had to be virtually fought off with the help of the S Swiss Cross envoy, which was luckily successful a couple of times. But um, eventually the um, front line reached us. And uh, so we had not only uh, the danger of the um, Hungarian Nazi troops, uh, the Arrow Cross and, and, and the nearby German army, which was stationed all around us, but um, we were heavily bombed and a number of times we had to change uh, base because uh, because of that. Um, a building was shot to pieces above our heads virtually and we were all in the cellars and luckily no children died. One adult did though above us. So, um, um, I'd like to um, turn to explaining um, one or two events that um, highlight what fear and uh, terror there was uh, even before any arrest or transportation. Um, a cousin of mine from the countryside was staying with my aunt briefly in Budapest and it was decided that it was time she went home, uh, taking a train to the south of Hungary. And my aunt Ergi was uh, taking her, uh, this cousin Ilonka, um, to, to board the train to the station. They already bought the tickets and uh, they waved goodbye at the barriers. When my aunt discovered with, with her in great horror that an arrow cross, arrow cross um, raiding party arrived and arrested my cousin just before 
she boarded the train. My aunt was in, at a little distance and, and there's nothing she could do without endangering her own arrest. And um, I think this highlights a kind of uh, mental anguish that some of this situation could create. To be completely paralyzed, unable to help, and having to witness the arrest of a, of a loved one. Um, this aunt, this uh, cousin Ilonka was immediately transported to Auschwitz, but she was a young 18 year old, quite strong and put to work and miraculously she survived and returned. Um, in another situation, um, somebody, uh, another boy who was at the same home as, as I was, uh, I read later his story. He was a little bit older. He was 12 years old and he was on a tram traveling in Budapest uh, with, his, with his parents. Uh, the rule was that Jews could only travel on the last coach of a train or, or tram. Uh, that was part of the um, humiliating limitations of the, of the Jewish, repeated Jewish legislation. So there they were on a tram, crowded tram, and uh, the, the, the boy at, at 12 was very interested in uh, watching the driver and moved forward to stand behind the driver in the front carriage uh, to watch him working the levers. At one of the stops, uh, Aerocross raiding party boarded the train, a tram rather, and, uh, and started arresting, uh, asking for papers and arresting anybody who was Jewish. And so the parents fell into that net uh, of, of arrest and suddenly they had to make a decision whether to contact their own son a little distance further up or or just let him be and uh, possibly thereby saving him so they had to they made the quick decision not to contact him they were arrested taken to auschwitz and uh, and they never never survived never saw their son again, or a son, his parents. And, um, and the, as I say, he eventually turned up in the same homes where, where I was on false papers, and he survived the war, but as an orphan. And a couple more minutes, please, Stephen. Um, I, I told this uh, couple of stories to show the mental uh, horror and the aspect, a different aspect of the Holocaust, which is not so immediately obvious, of having to make life um, defining decisions in complete ignorance and darkness and, um, and, and bearing the consequences of it. And uh, also the tremendous fear always in the air and the, and the systematic humiliation wearing the yellow star and similar, and then these, these, these awful legislation. And what came across to me in considering that is that this is entirely paralleled in Gaza today. They have the same racist um, attack on them with the same kind of awful mental consequences that we also suffer during the Holocaust. And as a result, I find any um, linkage that Israel tries to make between the Holocaust of the Second World War and, and using it as any justification for what they are doing currently, um, their genocide is completely abhorrent and, um, and disgusting. Thank, and, uh, you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. Um, a very sobering reminder of the horror, the terror, the fear, and that that still goes on in parts of the world. Um, so, so thank you, Stephen. Okay.